94. Ignition. If you feel optimistic and energetic you make a shifting equilibrium calculation. This is based on the assumption that although the gas composition will change during the expansion process, the entropy will not. So your next step is to add up the entropies of all the species present in the chamber, and put the figure on a piece of paper where you won't forget it. Entropies are in the compilations, too. Then, you guess at the exhaust temperature, at the exhaust pressure you have decided upon. And then you determine the composition of the exhaust gas, just as you did the chamber composition. And add up the entropies, there, and compare it with the chamber entropy. And try another exhaust temperature, and so on. Finally you have the exhaust conditions, and can calculate the enthalpy per unit mass. 2. H. C. H. E. L there. And then, finally, C. T equals H. C. H. E. Slash H. C. M solid and liquid exhaust products complicate the process somewhat when they appear, but that's the general idea. There is nothing complicated about it, but the execution is insufferably tedious. And yet I know people who have been doing performance calculations for 20 years and are still apparently sane. The time and labor involved in an exact performance calculation had two quite predictable consequences. The first was that those calculations which were made were cherished as fine gold, for shifting equilibrium calculations read platinum, circulated, compiled, and squirreled away by anyone who could get his hands on them. The second consequence was that everybody and his uncle was demanding an approximate, or short method. And these were forthcoming, in considerable variety. The most elaborate of these took the form of molly or charts of the combustion products of various propellant combinations. These usually plotted enthalpy versus entropy, with isotherms and isobars cutting across the chart. A typical set of charts would be for the combustion products of jet fuel with various proportions of oxygen. Another, the decomposition products of 90% peroxide, another, ammonia and oxygen, at various O slash F ratios. Some were more general, applying to a defined mixture of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen atoms, without specifying what propellants were involved. These charts were easy to use, and gave results in a hurry, but they seldom apply to exactly the combination you had in mind. They were also very difficult to construct, involving, as they did, dozens of calculations. The Bureau of Mines, with its extensive experience with combustion phenomena, was a leader in this field. A more general but less informative method was developed in 1949. Performance 95 by Hoddle, Satterfield, and Williams at MIT. This could be used for practically any combination in the Chan system, but using it for any chamber pressure other than 300 Cia, or any exhaust pressure other than 14. 7. Was an involved and messy procedure. I later modified and streamlined the method, and made some provision for other elements, and published it in 1955 as the NARTS method of performance calculation. Yeah. These, and similar graphical methods, involve, essentially, an interpolation between accurately calculated systems, and they gave a fairly good approximation of the results of a shifting equilibrium calculation. The other group of methods gave, generally, results that approximated those of a frozen equilibrium calculation, and were based on the equation C equals 2H slash MXTJ, 1, 2. The usual procedure was to determine H by ignoring any minor products, pretending that there wasn't any dissociation. The products in the Chan system were assumed to be co. Okay. 2. H. 2. O. Co. H. 2. And N. 2. Once the water gas equilibrium was determined, 
that was done by using the equilibrium constant at some arbitrary temperature, such as 2000 K, or at the whim of the operator. It didn't matter too much, asterisk H could be determined by simple arithmetic. As for Q, with a little experience you could make a pretty good guess at it, and any error would be halved when you took the square root of your guess. Or, if you wanted to be fancy, you could determine the average C. P. Of your gases at somewhere near what you thought your chamber temperature ought to be. And plug that into the efficiency term Tom Reinhardt's 1947 method included curves of temperature vs enthalpy for various exhaust gases, as well as C. P. Vs temperature. You determined your temperature from your enthalpy, and the C. P. From the temperature. The temperature, of course, was much too high, since dissociation was ignored. Ten years later I modified the method, eliminating the curves, devising a fast and easy way of getting an R slash C. P. Averaged over the whole temperature range, and providing a nomograph for calculating TJ from that and the pressure ratio. It was called the NQD Nart's Quick and Dirty. Method. The thing worked astoundingly well, giving results agreeing with complete shifting equilibrium calculations, I suppose that the averaged R slash C. P. Help there, to something like 1%. And you could make a calculation in 15 minutes. It worked best, too, when you postulated the simplest in fact the most simple-minded set of. Asterisk consider the case where 1 O. 2. 1 H. 2. And 1 C react. If the reaction went to H. 2. O and Co. The performance would vary by only 2.5% from the performance if it went to Co. 2. And H. 8. And this is the worst possible easel. 96 ignition. Products imaginable. And it was adaptable. When a man from Calorie Chemical Co. came in one day and told me for the first time about the BN system I learned that. In this system the exhaust products are hydrogen and solid BN. I hauled out my tables when he told me about it, and letting two atoms of carbon, graphite, pretend that they were one of molecule of BN, made a fast estimate. And lit on the nose. My value was within half a percent of the one he had obtained from a fancy machine calculation. The only trouble with the method was that I never could keep a copy for myself. Some character was always mooching my last copy, and I'd have to run off another 50 or so. There were other approximate methods developed, some as late as 1963, but they were all similar to those I've described. But the day of the shorthand method is gone as is. Thank God. The complete hand calculation. The computers started getting into the act in the early 50s, although considerable chemical sophistication was needed to make the most of their initially somewhat limited capabilities. At Bell Aerosystems they were considering fluorine as an oxidizer, and a mixture of hydrazine and methanol as the fuel, and demanded performance calculations. The programmer protested that he couldn't handle that many elements, And Tom Reinhardt retorted, the carbon and the oxygen will go to co. And you just tell the little man who lives inside that box to treat it exactly like nitrogen. End of problem. Oh, the compilations of thermodynamic data are on punch cards. Now, versatile programs, which can handle a dozen or so elements, are on tape, and things are a lot simpler than they were. But the chemical sophistication is still useful, as is a little common sense in interpreting the printout. As an example of the first, calculations were made for years on systems containing aluminum, using thermodynamic data on gaseous Al. 2. Oh. 3. Calculated from its assumed structure. And the results didn't agree too well with the experimental performances. And then an inconsiderate investigator proved that gaseous Al. 
didn't exist. Red faces all over the place. As an example of the second, consider the case of a propellant combination that produces a lot of solid carbon, say, in the exhaust stream. The machine makes its calculations on the assumption that the carbon is in complete thermal and mechanical equilibrium with the gaseous part of the exhaust. A bit of common sense suggests that this will not be so, since heat transfer is not an infinitely rapid process, and that the carbon may well be exhausted considerably hotter than the surrounding gas. So you look at the printout with considerable pessimism and wait for experimental results before committing yourself. Performance 97 A great deal of effort, in recent years, has gone into attempts to develop programs which will take things like heat transfer from solid to gas into account and which will allow for the actual velocity of the change in the exhaust composition during expansion. These are called kinetic programs, as opposed to the frozen or shifting equilibrium programs, and only the big computers make them possible. There is only one trouble with them. Reliable kinetic data are as hard to come by as honest aldermen and when you feed questionable data into the machine, questionable results come out at the other end. As the computer boys say, garbage in, garbage out. And there is one disconcerting thing about working with a computer it's likely to talk back to you. You make some tiny mistake in your Fortran language putting a letter in the wrong column, say, or omitting a comma and the 360 comes to a screeching halt and prints out rude remarks, like a legal format. Or unknown problem, or... If the man who wrote the program was really feeling nasty that morning, what's the matter stupid? Can't you read? Everyone who uses a computer frequently has had, from time to time, a mad desire to attack the precocious abacus with an axe. Rocket performance is not usually reported in terms of exhaust velocity, although the early workers wrote in those terms. Instead, it is reported as specific impulse, which is the exhaust velocity divided by the standard acceleration of gravity, 9.8 meters, or 32.2 feet per second to. This practice gives figures of a convenient size in the range of 200 to 400 or so, but it has led to some rather tortuous, if not ludicrous, definitions. The most common one is that specific impulse is the thrust divided by the weight flow of propellant, and it comes out in seconds. Putting the acceleration of gravity into the equation did that, but specifying the performance of a rocket, whose whole job is to get away from the Earth. In terms of the acceleration of gravity on the surface of that planet, seems to me to be a parochial, not to say a silly procedure. The Germans, during World War II, used an even sillier measure of performance, specific propellant consumption. Which was the reciprocal of specific impulse. This didn't even have the virtue of producing figures of a convenient size, but gave things like 0.00426 per second. Probably the best way of thinking of specific impulse is as a velocity expressed, not in meters or feet per second, but in units of 9.8 meters. Or 32.2 feet per second. That way you retain the concept of mass flow, which is relevant everywhere, and doesn't depend upon the local properties of one particular planet, and at the same time lets Euro. 98 Ignition Pian and American engineers understand each other. When he hears I. S. Equals 250, the European multiplies by 9.8 to get the exhaust velocity in meters per second, while the American does the same with 32.2 and comes out with feet per second. When will the US ever change over to MKS? I've told you what performance is, and I've described the way you go about calculating it. But now comes the practical problem of picking a propellant combination which will give you a good one. Here it will be helpful to go back to the velocity equation, C equals 2H slash M121. PE slash PC, RCP1 slash 2 and to consider the H slash M term and the efficiency term separately. Obviously, you want to make H slash M as large as possible. And to do this, it is useful to consider the exhaust gases you hope to get. 
the energy contributed by a molecule of combustion products equals the heat of formation of that molecule from its elements at 250 C. Plus its sensible heat above absolute zero, this is a very small item, minus the energy required to break down to their elements, at 250 C, the propellants which formed it. This last term is generally much smaller than the first otherwise we wouldn't have useful propellants. And sometimes it is negative, when a mole of hydrazine breaks down to hydrogen and nitrogen we get some 12 kilocalories as a free bonus. But the important item is the heat of formation of the product molecule. That we want as big as possible. And, obviously, to maximize H slash M, we must minimize M. So, to get a good energy term, we need an exhaust molecule with a high heat of formation and a low molecular weight. So far so good. But now let's look at the efficiency term. Obviously, we want to get it as close to 1.0 as possible, which means that we P E backslash R slash C P want to beat II down as far as we can. P E P C is, of course, smaller than 1, so to do this we must raise the exponent R slash C P as high as we can, which, of course, means that we want exhaust products with as low a CP as we can find. And so we are hunting for exhaust products which have a, a high heat of formation, be a low molecular weight, see a low CP. Alas, such paragons among exhaust products are hard to come by. Generally, if you have a good H slash M term, the R slash C P term is bad and vice versa. And if both are good, the chamber temperature can get uncomfortably high. If we consider specific exhaust products, this is what we find N two performance 99 and solid C are practically useless as energy producers HCl H 2 and co are fair asterisk co 2 is good while B 2 O 3 HBO 2 OBF BF 3 H 2 O and HF as well as solid B 2 O 3 and L 2 O 3 are excellent when we consider the R slash CP term the order is quite different the diatomic gases with an R slash CP above 0.2, are excellent. They include HF, H, 2, Co, HCl, and N, 2. Of course a monatomic gas has an R slash C, P, of 0.4, but finding a chemical reaction which will produce large quantities of hot helium is out of the range of practical politics. The triatomic gases, H 2 O OBF and Co 2 with an R slash C P between 0 0.12 and 0 0.15 are fair. The tetratomic HBO 2 and BF 3 at about 0 0.1 are poor and B 2 3. While, perhaps it should be passed over in silence. As for the solids, C, Al. 2. O. 3. And B. 2. O. 3. There are slash C. P. Is precisely zero, as would be the thermal efficiency if they were ever the sole exhaust products. Based with this situation, 
All the rocket man can do is hunt for a reasonable compromise. He would, if he could, choose pure hydrogen as his exhaust gas, since at any given temperature one gram of hydrogen has more heat energy in it than a gram of any other molecule around, one gram of H. 2. At 1000 K has almost 10 times the energy of one of HF at the same temperature, and its excellent R slash C. P. Makes it possible to use a large fraction of that energy for propulsion. So hydrogen is the ideal working fluid, and you always try to get as much of it as possible into your mix. For it has to be a mix, in a chemical rocket, anyway, since you need an energy source of some sort to heat that hydrogen up to 1000 K or 3000 K or whatever. And the only available energy source is the combustion of some of the hydrogen. So you bring some oxygen or fluorine into the picture, to burn part of the hydrogen to H. 2. O or HF, bringing the temperature up to 3000 K or so, and your exhaust gas is the mixture of H. 2. O or HF with the excess hydrogen. When hydrogen is the fuel, it is always used in excess, and never burned completely to water or HF. If it were, the chamber temperature would be uncomfortably high, and the R slash C P of the mixture would be lowered and the performance would drop. Hydrogen is so light that a considerable excess of it won't harm the H slash M term appreciably, and you get the maximum performance, generally. When you use only enough oxygen or fluorine to burn perhaps half of your fuel. If you're burning a hydrocarbon with oxygen, or if you're working, Asterisk the classification of hydrogen, as a fair contributor of energy even though it, naturally, has a zero heat of formation, is explained by the fact that the molecule is so light. At 25 degrees it has a sensible heat, or heat content of 2.024 kilocalories per mole above absolute zero, and since the molecular weight is only 2.016, its H slash M, even at room temperature, is 1 kilocalorie gm 100 ignition with the chan uh. system in general you generally get the maximum performance from a mixture ratio which gives a 1 0 0.5 to 1.20 ratio of reducing to oxidizing valences in the chamber that is you work a little on the rich side of stoichiometric to get some co and h 2 into the mixture and improve r slash c P. Rich and lean in the rocket business mean exactly what they do in a carburetor. If you're using a halogen oxidizer with a storable fuel, the best results generally show up if your mixture ratio makes the number of fluorine atoms, plus chlorine atoms, if any, exactly equal the number of hydrogen atoms. If there is any carbon in the combination, it's a good idea to get enough oxygen into the system to burn it to co so you won't have any solid carbon in the exhaust. And if your energy producing species is a solid or liquid at the exhaust temperature. BO, AL, 2, O, 3, are examples the thing to do, of course, is to cram as much hydrogen as possible into the combination. Asterisk. These are just a few of the things that the propellant chemist has to consider when he's looking for performance. And coming up with propellant combinations which will perform as the engineers want them to is what he's paid for. Inadequately. This is how he goes about it. The engineering group have been given the job of designing the propulsion system of a new surface tow air missile ASAM. It is specified by the customer that it must work at any temperature likely to be encountered in military operations. The maximum dimensions are fixed, so that the missile will fit on existing launchers. It must be a packaged job, loaded at the factory, so that propellants won't have to be handled in the field. It must not leave a visible trail, which would make countermeasures easier. And, of course, it must have a much higher performance than the present system, which burns acid UDMH. The customer probably makes a dozen more demands, most of them impossible, but that will do for a starter. 
The engineers, in turn, before sitting down to their drawing boards, demand of the propellant chemist that he produce a combination that will make the missile do what the customer wants it to do. They also add some impossible demands of their own. The chemist crawls into his hole to consider the matter. What he'd like to recommend is the hydrazine chlorine pentafluoride, for historical reasons, CLF. 5. Is generally called compound a combination. It has the highest performance of any practical storable combination known, all the exhaust products are diatomic, and two-thirds of them are HF, and it has a nice fat density, so you can stuff a lot of it into a small tank. But he remembers that all weather constrained, and reminds. Performance 101. Himself that you can never tell where you might have to fight a war, and that the freezing point of hydrazine is somewhat incompatible with the climate of Baffin land. So the next best bet is, probably MHF3, a 14 to 86 mixture of hydrazine and methyl hydrazine with the empirical formula CO8IH. 5. 6. 2N. 2. Its freezing point is down to the magic 54 degrees. There are other possible fuels, but they may be somewhat dangerous, and he knows that MHF3 is safe, and works. But, with CLF. 5. MHF3 would leave a trail of black smoke leading right back to the launcher definitely undesirable if the crew of the latter want to live to fire another round. Also, his professional soul, it's the only soul he has left after all these years in the business, is revolted by the thought of that free carbon and its effect on the R slash C. P. Term and what it will do to his performance. So he decides to spike his oxidizer with a bit of oxygen to take care of the carbon. Which means spiking it with an oxygen containing storable oxidizer. The only one of these which can live with compound A is perchloral fluoride, PF. So PF it will be. He knows that when you have carbon and hydrogen in your system, along with oxygen and fluorine and chlorine, you generally get the best performance when the oxygen and carbon balance out to co. And the hydrogen and the halogens balance to HF and HCl. So he doodles around a bit, and comes up with the equation. C. 0. 0.8 IH. 5. 62. N. 2. Plus 0 0.27 CLO. 3. F plus 0 0.84. F plus 0 0.8467 CLF 5 equals 0 0.81 Co plus N 2 plus 1.1167 HC1 plus 4.5033 HF That looks good lots of HF and hence a lot of energy. And there's nothing but diatomic gases in the exhaust, which means a good R slash C. P which means, in turn, that a gratifyingly large fraction of that energy will go into propulsion. To find out what that fraction will be, he packs up his notes and pays a call on the IBM 360. The results of the consultation are pleasing, so he converts his mole fractions into weight percentages, and calls on the engineers. Your fuel is MHF3, he announces, and your oxidizer is 80% A and 20 PF. And your O slash F is 2.18. And Muttonhead says. Who's Muttonhead? Muttonhead's the computer. He says that the performance, shifting, at 1000 slash 14.7 pounds is 306.6 seconds, and say that if you can't ring out 290 on the test stand you're not half as good as you say you are. But watch your O slash F. If you're lean the performance will drop off in a hurry, and if you go rich you'll smoke like crazy, the density is 1.39, and the chamber temperature is 4160K. If you want it in Fahrenheit, convert it yourself. 102 Ignition 
He then retreats hurriedly to his lair, pursued by the imprecations of the engineers, who, A, complain that the density is too low, and B, that the chamber temperature is much too high and whoever heard of anybody operating that hot anyway.